Hello everyone, uh, dear excellencies, colleagues, students, friends. I'm um, Olga Bagdanova from Johann Schutte Institute of Political Studies of the University of Tartu. And this is my honor to open another lecture dedicated to Polish journalist and writer Wieczor Kapuczynski. This is already a fifth such event at the University of Tartu and on behalf of our university, I'm thankful for the organizers and uh, for those joining this online lecture from different corners of the world. I'm happy to see that hosting a Kapuczynski lecture at the University of Tartu third, every third year is becoming a nice tradition and that our audience is growing uh, wider thanks to digitalization and viral spread of online and distant learning. Uh, the COP talk uh, event or a project is funded by the European Commission and the United Nations Development Programme since 2009. And it gives us opportunity, um, us academic institutions, universities and our students from uh, the EU member states to discuss various uh, important issues related to um, CDGs, democracy, climate change or public policy matters. And this lecture today, entitled uh, Remaining Ways to Achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, Innovations in Finance and digital Digitalization, is dedicated to an important question, whether we are ready to meet sustainable development goals in the time of rapid change, economic crisis and COVID unpredictability. Can or should we go greener, cleaner, faster or safer? Or we just need to stop rushing, look at the beauty of nature around us and be present. Hereby, I would like to wish all of you an interesting online experience, spark for a future thought and enjoyable discussion. And I pass the micro microphone to my colleagues and speakers and I welcome here Erika Gerentsen, the head of unit of uh, Director General for International Cooperation and Development of, U of the European Commission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olga, um, for the introduction and these uh, very inspiring words. Um, so I would like you also in the name of the commission to um, uh, to welcome you in this uh, in this event and uh, and and first and foremost to to thank uh, the organizers of the uh, of the event uh, who have been uh, involved in the preparation in particular uh, Jan Jasinski of the Euro United Nations Development Program the UNDP and of course uh, the University of Tartu who is hosting uh, today's uh, Kapuscinski development lecture as Olga, you just said, uh, since 2009, uh, the European Commission and the UNDP, um, uh, as well, uh, together with the most prestigious uh, universities around the world, um, um, organize these uh, these events um, uh, to promote uh, uh, lectures uh, that touch upon many facets of international cooperation and, and development. Uh, so far, already more than 100 lectures have actually been delivered. 130,000 people uh, have um, attended uh, those various uh, lectures. Um, and, and of course, digitalization, as you just said, um, is, is giving an opportunity to, to increase uh, the audience. And thereby, I would like to welcome you all who are attending uh, today's uh, today's event. Um, the development lectures the honor the name and legacy of a talented Polish journalist and, and writer, uh, Richard Kapusinski. Uh, he is often quoted for saying that uh, life is truly known only to those who suffer, lose, endure uh, adversity and stumble from uh, defeat to defeat. Um, and indeed, today we live in a world where uh, we are all interconnected and where um, challenges are global. And Kapuscinski belongs to this category of those who, through their work, have helped um, us to, to open our eyes to the world and to the world uh, challenges and, and to, 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 to face them, but also to try and find solutions together uh, in, in our globality. 
So we need to understand what is happening and how we can address uh, the, these global challenges. I, I really liked uh, the, the way Olga you presented it by saying, "Let's let's look outside. Let's let's look at the world, and uh, and stop for a moment." And this is probably also what we can do together this afternoon. Um, as you as you all know, the, the European Union is very committed to remaining a global leader in development um, and to finding multilateral solutions to global problems. But we will not um, stand still whilst uh, the world changes around us. Uh, the leadership requires um, that we seek to shape our environment and that we encourage others to play their part. More than ever before in these challenging times where COVID-19 has uh, reverted positive progress um, on many sustainable development goals, unfortunately, the EU is determined to, to implement the 2030 Agenda uh, through our internal and uh, external uh, action that is within the EU as well as uh, outside the EU. So addressing the COVID crisis requires uh, in the long term a um, transformative agenda. It is actually going to speed up this transformative agenda which the EU had already um, initiated with the priorities uh, around the Green Deal and the digital agenda. And um, our leadership and our president, uh, Mrs. von der Leyen has called for a global recovery initiative to promote this green, digital, just and, and resilient um, recovery. Um, but all actors, the parliaments, the local authorities, civil society, including the private sector and, and the scientific community, they, they all need to contribute by integrating their, the SDGs into their own work. So for us, really, the SDGs, they actually, they, they, they remain um, extremely valid. And more than that, they are actually um, um, uh, more uh, valid than they have uh, ever been uh, before. And therefore, today's lecture is particularly topical, I think, because it's, it's, uh, if we want to achieve these SDGs uh, together, and as well as the Paris Agreement uh, and its objectives, we will need to, uh, to find new ways of uh, doing business. I am actually very eager to hear um, your views on innovations uh, in finance and to listen to today's um, presentation. In the EU, we are constantly trying to innovate where it, when it comes to mobilizing both the public and the private resources for um, investment, aiming at supporting sustainable development. The EU is at the forefront of global efforts to build a transparent financial system that supports sustainable growth. For instance, with the development of an EU taxonomy, of sustainable economic activities and a reliable EU green bond standard. And our president uh, has just announced, uh, the, Mrs. von der Leyen, that um, for the first time ever, we will seek to fund our own budget, the next generation EU budget, through the issuance of, uh, of green bonds. So through our European Fund for Sustainable Development, uh, which is uh, the external um, uh, arm of, of, of our action. We have made tremendous progress also in, uh, in, in providing guarantees and blending to raise private, sec to raise private sector financing and, and to contribute to filling the enormous financing gap to meet the SDGs in, in our partner countries. So these are the, the, the innovations that we are working on, uh, on on the financial side, and there are many more that we that, that we could also uh, discuss. Then, when it comes to digitalization, um, here again, I, I would uh, please allow me to to echo our president, uh, Mrs. von der Leyen, when she gave her State of the Union address in the European Parliament a few weeks uh, ago, when she said, "Imagine for a moment life in this pandemic without digital uh, in our lives. We wouldn't be here to get together today." Uh, and, and, and most of the things that we have done and that we have maintained at global level wouldn't be maintained. Um, this, this creates a link between us, which is absolutely essential in today's uh, situation. So this, this um, clearly this emergency has uh, revealed how crucial digital and data technologies are for our economies and societies across all continents. And we seek, to, we seek to build a healthier and, and greener world uh, through digital technologies, reaching out to the least developed um, areas and, and the most vulnerable people around the world. And, and we, we want everyone really to, to be connected and, and to be able to grasp the benefits of, of this digital, digital age uh, while being um, from um, um, uh, unintended and uncontrolled risks, um, being safe of the, the, the risks which are related to, 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 this, uh, to this digitalization. 
So this is um, th th this is a, a little bit, and I don't want to be too long to to frame the, the today's uh, today's discussion on the first and on the uh, finance financial uh, innovation and the digital uh, agenda. Linking these topics uh, of finance and digitalization, the Commission will launch. Um, a new digital uh, finance strategy by the end of this year, and uh, and this lecture therefore is extremely uh, timely in this uh, in this context. Every Kapuscinski development lecture brings a new perspective to the table. This one is not an exception, and it is really a privilege uh, for uh, for me, for us as European Commission, together with uh, the UNDP and uh, the University of Tartu, to welcome for this lecture the CEO of Grameen Capital um, India. I would like to encourage the wider audience to join the debate also on uh, Twitter using the hashtag uh, CapTalks and, um, and to, uh, to, to participate uh, uh, actively in the debate uh, that will uh, follow the, the presentation. So for now, thanks a lot. Thanks, uh, thanks for, for organizing the event again and uh, uh, over now to the, to the presenters for, for, the, for the presentation that I'm looking forward to listen to. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Erika, and uh, me also on behalf of, uh, of UNDP. I'd like to thank uh, Royston for accepting the, the invitation. We were about to meet actually in, in spring this year, uh, physically in Tartu, uh, but, uh, but it's, the, the, the times are, are a bit different. So it also brings uh, some additional advantages and opportunities to reach out to, to other audiences. Um, uh, and, and thank you very much, uh, Rika and the European Commission for uh, uh, partnering uh, with us on, on the lectures. Uh, and, and it's always great to be in a way back at, at uh, University of Tartu. Uh, so thank you, Olga, for, for bringing it all together. Um, the, the topic of today's lecture is, uh, is, is really crucial also at the heart of what we're doing at and, and advocating for it at UNDP. Uh, in terms of, um, it's, it, these are dif difficult times in terms of putting the balance between the, the public health, the socioeconomic development, the personal freedoms and so on. Uh, and uh, we, we, we're really concerned as well uh, about the uh, growing uh, inequality and increases in poverty due to the pandemic. Uh, I hope it, it also, this situation brings some opportunities for sustainable development, particularly for sustainable development. Uh, and, uh, and we hope to hear uh, more from, from Royston on it. On it. Uh, we're also live streaming, uh, as it was mentioned on, on the Facebook. You will be able to um, ask questions during the presentation or afterwards to, uh, to Royston using the Q&A uh, function. Uh, the, the event will be uh, moderated by, uh, by Michael, uh, who will uh, now introduce uh, Royston, our keynote speaker. Uh, so uh, we'll have, in terms of the agenda, we'll have the keynote speech of Royston, uh, the, the presentation, and then uh, the, uh, the discussion moderated by, uh, by Michael. Uh, and yes, I would, I would encourage you all also to, uh, to uh, put your questions in the, in the Q&A. Uh, Q&A function on, uh, on Zoom and uh, yeah, enjoy the lecture. Thank you. Over to you, Mikael. Thank you, Jan. And uh, let me uh, also uh, give a very warm welcome here. And it's a pleasure to have a distinguished speaker, uh, Royston uh, Braganza from, uh, from the Grameen Capital, uh, which uh, is part of the larger Grameen um, uh, family of companies with a very prominent uh, Grameen Bank, uh, the, the founder of uh, whom uh, was a, uh, or is an overlord uh, as well. Uh, now Grameen, uh, uh, well, is a, is a very specific uh, type of bank and then the family of companies around them are also doing something quite extraordinary. So uh, actually I think maybe the, the simplest question to, to, uh, to put to uh, Royston is if you could briefly tell us how did you come with a very long background in, in, in banking? You've been working with HSBC, with, uh, with uh, Citibank. Why and how did you switch from a very, let's say, traditional banking to something that is quite innovative, you know, quite different? Uh, uh, since, uh, since 2007, you've been the head uh, or the CEO of Grameen Capital and the head of operations in India as well. So maybe you could briefly 
introduce uh, your journey uh, to to these uh, quite interesting uh, endeavors. At the start, let me say thank you. Uh, can I also do a sound check, Mikhail? Is it fine? Yes, I can hear very well. All right, excellent. Uh, so thank you, everyone. I think Aita is the word when I say it in Estonian. Uh, so it's a pleasure being here. Thank you, Erica, for those kind words and Jan uh, for that lovely introduction. Uh, I often joke, uh, Mikhail, that my journey, unlike everyone else who's going up the corporate ladder, mine is coming down. So I started in corporate bank, then investment bank, then mid-market, then SME, uh, then microfinance. So after about a decade in Citibank and uh, the corporate bank, investment bank, mid-market, uh, joined HSBC to set up their SME business and then set up their global microfinance business and then rock bottom with Grameen. So unlike everyone else, which is the race to the top, mine is the race to the bottom. Uh, and it's been a fascinating journey of... Uh, of excitement, of interest, and, and high energy and passion. Uh, and hopefully over the next uh, 40 minutes or so, some of that will uh, I will be able to share both learning, successes, failures, and hopefully some passion. Thank you very much. I, I think that, I mean, you presented it in a very uh, controversial way, but if I, if I would look at the same time at, let's say, the social impact of what you're doing, then it's probably the other way around uh, that, uh, from the additional banking to something that really makes a crucial difference to people on the ground who, who, who uh, are in, in, in need of these resources, which, uh, which you, through your organization, are able to provide them. Um, uh, but I presume uh, your talk is going to reflect on that as well. Um, and then, then we will uh, get to know a bit better what you're doing, because uh, obviously it's informed, uh, uh, informed by your uh, daily actions with uh, with I mean capital. So uh, in order not to uh, spend more time, uh, I think uh, we should give the floor to you and uh, looking very much forward to the, uh, to the talk and uh, to an interesting discussion afterwards as well. So please. Thank you so much. Uh, again, let me just do a quick check, both in terms of sound and video. Is that okay? Yes, uh, we can see the slides. Excellent. So once again, welcome everyone. It's a pleasure being here. Uh, it's always a joy, especially interacting with young people and the University of Tartu uh, was my host last year when I spoke to the students there as well as uh, hosted by the leadership and the government in Tartu and Estonia. And uh, today we are here to share in a very different world. It seems like 2019 was another planet altogether. Uh, and therefore, uh, really, in some ways, uh, this summarizes all of that's happened. Uh, there's a saying that uh, there are decades in which nothing happens, and then there are weeks in which decades happen. And really, we seem to be living in those weeks, as Erica mentioned as well. Uh, there is an upheaval that's happening across the world, uh, probably the greatest geopolitical upheaval since World War II or probably the most or the greatest economic upheaval since the Great Depression of 1929, uh, or even some experts feel 1870. So uh, it, it is unprecedented times in terms of where we are living. Uh, the world financial crisis in 2008, which is in recent memory, uh, people feel that this will have double uh, negative impact uh, in terms of slowdown and recession. And so uh, it is in this time, literally in the last, two quarters, two decades of effort uh, seems to have been undone when it comes to working at the bottom of the pyramid. And so we are situated in a time that is extremely critical. And yet, uh, you know, we used to use the term VUCA world even before COVID. Uh, and suddenly that seems very tame. Uh, the volatility, uh, the uncertainty, the complexity. Uh, so 2020 BC is actually 2020 before COVID. And there already were pre-existing conditions. Uh, and we know from COVID that those who have pre-existing conditions are far more susceptible uh, to the impact or to the adverse impact uh, of the crisis. And therefore, whether there was a geopolitical volatility, whether there was an environmental crisis, whether there were challenges around Brexit and the implications on the EU and the global economy, uh, it's 
suddenly got exacerbated by uh, the situation around COVID. And so the pre-existing conditions coming into 2020 complicated or in a junction or conjunction with uh, the COVID challenges seem to have really set us back in a significant manner. In fact, recently Bill Gates said that in the last 25 weeks, uh, it has undone what we've done in the last 25 years. And so we really seem to be at a time where we are all uh, challenged to rethink, reimagine the way we want to respond. And so the traditional aspect is always, how do we respond to a crisis? How do we plan the recovery? How do we build resilience in the system? And yet today's talk is focused on the fourth R. How do we reimagine each of these aspects so that we can not only build back better, and that seems to be the theme that everyone's talking about, building back better. But I think we want to also build back not only better, but cleaner, greener, and more inclusive. And that is why we are challenged to be able to reimagine the way uh, we are looking at innovation and building forward. And to help us in that process, I want to focus on two areas, finance and digitalization. Uh, and to be uh, with my two hosts, it's not going to be difficult to remember the key words of European Commission and UNDP. Uh, so I've highlighted that. So if those of you who want to remember those uh, themes that we are talking about today, the areas that we are reimagining, they are in the areas of finance, they are in the areas of digitalization. In the areas of finance, uh, we are living in a world that is joined up. That's clear. We are all connected. Again, Erica mentioned the word interconnectedness, and I think that is so true. We're seeing that effect, that a health crisis turned into an economic crisis, which snowballed into a humanitarian crisis. There is tremendous interconnectivity between each of us and everything around us. And therefore, the challenge for us, uh, it's called a pandemic, not for nothing. It's pan, it's across, it cuts across all the different challenges that we have. 66% of the European Union's GDP uh, is from export import, which means there is always going to be a connectedness. New Zealand, which seems to have the least impact due to COVID, is still having an impact on its economy. So it's very difficult to believe that if we are not building an ecosystem that is together, connected, and supporting each other, there's bound to be a struggle going forward. And in that reimagining of the ecosystem, we are called and challenged to reimagine capital. What does capital look like reimagined? Can we have capital with a conscience? Can we have something called selfless capitalism? Professor Yunus always talks about the selflessness and how do we build with selflessness in mind? How do we create social businesses where it is a business, but for a social cause? It is to be able to create and build and sustain enterprises, whether it's in water or sanitation or clean energy that are able to build with conscious capital. And therefore, one of the things that we will talk about today is reimagining the way we look at capital, reimagine the way we look at capitalism and see whether there is new ways, nuances, or even nudges that COVID is giving us into a direction that we can build better, cleaner, greener, and more sustainable, more inclusive. Let's come to digitalization. And we're seeing, I think the key really is the ubiquity of the mobile phone. Uh, as Ms. Wanderlein talked about, the fact that we could not even imagine a world uh, trying to cope with COVID without technology, whether you're doing contact tracing, whether you're doing online schools and colleges, as the University of Tartu was sharing with me earlier, most of their programs are online. Uh, and we're seeing that across the board in the slums in Mumbai, in the villages in India, in the situation in Africa, in Nairobi, in Kibera, everywhere we're talking about the use of mobile phones to track health, education, and various other pieces, giving us therefore a really good handle into the way we can reach the lives of others. Uh, the other very interesting paradigm uh, to reimagine is how do we use new tech? How do we use the blockchain? Uh, the World Food Program, who won the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, does an immense uh, immensely attractive, interesting program with Syrian refugees using the blockchain. The blockchain is being used in South Africa uh, to help people to go into solar and connect on the grid and off the grid and get their net cost of 
uh, of consumption. Uh, and so the ability for us to use artificial intelligence, uh, to use machine learning in the way we create scoring modules, uh, to create predictive uh, Gini coefficients when we are lending, all of these, as you talked about building a digital finance strategy, we're being given really uh, a huge whiteboard, as it were, to reimagine how that new digital finance world is going to look like and how is that data going to be really used. It's often said that data is the new oil. I tend to agree, but I say it's even better. You can even reuse the data. You can't reuse the oil. And therefore, the ability for us uh, to use that data, to use it sympathetically, to use it creatively, is the challenge for us. While restricting, while maintaining privacy, while respecting uh, the source of that data, how do we use it for the best uh, for the person so that no one is left behind? Those are the challenges that we need to create because the person finally uh, is, uh, and that's what people talk about, that with the data, you can actually create a segment of one. And beautifully, all 17 goals come together to say, no one is left behind. For not one to be left behind, we need to be able to design products, to design services, to design social outreach for that segment of one. And that is the challenge for each of us. Not a broad brush, one size fits all, but an ability to be able to zero in, to be able to serve every single one, the last, the least, and the lost in the way that we are called as human beings. And therefore, uh, we want to look at different aspects of how do we build this capital with a conscience ecosystem. I want to share with you our own story. Uh, when, when we started Grameen Capital India, this was in 2007, uh, when I was asked to start it in India, we had 400 million people, less than $2 a day. Now, this was staggering. Grameen Foundation, which had done work in Central Eastern Europe, Middle East, Africa, Latin America, uh, was trying to figure out how do we attract capital? How do we scale microfinance to 400 million people? Uh, and one of the things that we quickly decided was not to start a microfinance company because if we go all by ourselves to solve and include 400 million people, it would take us probably a lifetime or more than that. But what we already knew was there were about 100 NGOs that were already doing microfinance in some form or shape. Many had gone across the border to Bangladesh. Many had learned the model, were doing it in a village, in a town, in a slum, in a pocket, in a province, in a geography. And we said, is there a way, rather than telling all of these 100 stop doing what you're doing, don't copy us, this is our copyright. We did something more unique. We don't believe in copyright, but we believe in copy left. It is left behind for you to copy, and we will support you in growing, because that's where our mission is, to be able to include everyone and to be able to do it and bring people along. And therefore we said, what is the single largest constraint for these 100 NGOs to grow so that they could reach more customers? And we identified capital as the single largest constraint. And we said, how do we help them to raise capital? And so we helped these NGOs to transition from NGOs to for-profit, from for-profit to non-bank finance companies, from non-bank finance companies to mainstream banks. We actually worked with the governor of the central bank to write the policy to create small finance banks and build that whole momentum around uh, allowing capital access uh, into these organizations. And two years ago, when I finished my term as the chair of the Indian Microfinance Network, uh, we had reached 52 million clients, which means on an average, and all 52 million were women, which means about five to six members in a household, we had already reached 300 million people in less than 10 years. And that therefore is innovating, is building an ecosystem, is bringing other people along, to create a solution. And therefore, after Grameen Capital, we set up two years ago, Grameen Impact. And that was to focus on the adjacent sector, affordable health, affordable education, clean energy, water, sanitation. Because we said, how can we bring the learnings? How can we bring the network? How can we bring all that we have learned to other sectors in the broader, what are now called the impact space? And then we wanna look at an equity fund and then a social stock exchange. We're working with the finance minister in India to already design 
a social stock exchange. And we were talking to Pierre Gramigna, who is the finance minister in Luxembourg, and they have a green exchange and doing wonderful work. And when, uh, again, Erica, you mentioned about green bonds and Ms. von der Leyen's uh, intent in using green bonds, I think we're on the right track. We're working together uh, and we're creating really sustainable pools of capital to be able to build back better. And, and in that, uh, really, there is this whole impact continuum, the whole capital continuum from philanthropy uh, to double bottom line funding to mainstream capital. And we're seeing across the world a very interesting paradigm of impact investing scaling up. Over $715 billion has been invested in impact assets uh, over the recent years. Mainstream names, BlackRock, Bain, Goldman, K uh, KKR, and others are all part of this journey because sustainable investing, ESG investing, SRI, are all becoming very important themes as we build and scale up. In India alone, and the last bar talks about India, uh, we've had about $15 billion invested uh, in the impact investing space. Uh, there is a new, uh, within the funds architecture under the Social uh, the Securities Exchange Board, uh, we have a new entity called the Social Venture Capital Fund. In fact, we were instrumental uh, in helping to write that policy. And, and we are seeing, therefore, a whole momentum around what we call the JAM trilogy. JAM standing for Jandhan, which is everybody or people's account. So uh, 200 million accounts were opened in a very short time so that everyone has access to a bank account. Uh, the Aadhaar is the unique ID or the identification number. And so everyone has a biometric identification over a billion people. And then of course, the huge ubiquity of mobile penetration. And so all of that together, focusing on the priority sectors, we've been able to see how even corporates and others can be part of that story. So there is a 2% CSR, which means corporate profits, 2% uh, of those have to be kept aside for corporate social responsibility and other activities. So how do we bring different pools of capital? Just yesterday, the OECD released a report on blended finance guidelines. And it's very interesting. You talked about uh, Ms. von der Leyen talking about green bonds. OECD is talking about this. Uh, globally, we seem to see a very interesting momentum around financing of uh, sustainable development. And, and microfinance is an extremely positive success story. We've seen that uh, a sector that literally uh, 10, 15 years ago in India uh, has scaled up dramatically today to 93 million accounts that are open, uh, a $25 billion portfolio across microfinance companies. Uh, two or more have been listed on the stock exchange, one of them 40 times oversubscribed. And for us, therefore, very clearly proving that you can do well and do good at the same time. You don't need to say, I'm going to compromise on profits, I'm going to compromise on scale, if I'm serving the bottom of the pyramid. There is an ability, if you design it well, if you focus on building businesses for good, you can do well and good at the same time. And so the microfinance example should encourage us to look at agribusinesses, affordable education businesses, affordable healthcare businesses, affordable housing businesses, financial services, as you talked about digital finance uh, and utilities. How do we bring them all together for the common good? And there isn't a better time than now with COVID uh, really sort of throwing the cat among the pigeons of how we are able to serve and how do we build back a better, more inclusive society. Microfinance is not a silver bullet, but it goes alongside all of these very critical pieces so that in these adjacent sectors, we are challenged to reimagine business. And, and as we speak, businesses are being reimagined across boardrooms, and even Basilicas, Pope Francis on the 4th of October uh, released his encyclical uh, and, and again, extremely powerful, talking about how all of us are interconnected, how probably we need to reimagine the way we serve our people, how important it is to dream together, how can we serve everyone? And exactly a year ago in August uh, 2019, 181 CEOs sat in their boardrooms, came together and said, we were signed probably different to what Friedman talked about, where he said the business of business is business. He's saying 
Each of us in our individual companies serves our corporate purpose, share a fundamental commitment to all our stakeholders. Purpose is not the sole pursuit of profit, but an animating force for achieving them. You cannot divorce any more profits from purpose. It's impossible to build a sustainable organization without investing in employees, being customer-centric, ethical supply chains, and having uh, the environment and sustainability at the core uh, of your operations. And so we are being challenged to reimagine the way we design business, reimagine the way we design finance, but most importantly, reimagine the way we work with the poorest of the poor. Because as we are seeing today, uh, and, and, and estimates seem to range between 100 million to 500 million people who could fall below the poverty line because of the last six months. Now, how uh, just tragic is that? The fact that 25 years of work seem to be eroded, uh, you know, literally in 25 weeks. How can we therefore put our heads together, put our shoulders to the wheel together, and put our minds together above all, put our hearts together to be able to create a, a solution to be able to finance this huge gaping hole. Uh, two years ago when I was at the UN General Assembly and speaking there in September, uh, the first thing that struck me was the need for $30 trillion to finance the SDG gap. Uh, and, and it was very humbling to be able to, first of all, address uh, that August forum. But the fact that we are seeing uh, this huge shortfall and, and a bulk of these are uh, you know, gaps in the global south. How do we create, therefore, as Dr. Shamshad Akhtar says, innovation that can divert public, private capital towards development? And two things really struck me. One, $30 trillion is an enormous shortfall. And coming post-COVID, we seem to see that number inching towards $40 trillion. Where is that money going to come from? How do we create pools of capital that can attract that money? And, and therefore, uh, I was encouraged because we saw the same story in microfinance. We saw a $50 billion need, and at that time, it was less than $5 billion of supply. And yet, we were able to scale that close to $30 billion uh, in 10 years' time. So it is possible if we create market-based solutions. It is possible if we can attract mainstream capital. But how do we attract mainstream capital if they don't know uh, that there is a treasure at the bottom of the pyramid, that there is a sustainable business model that exists there? And that's the role of where philanthropy, where governments, where donor money, where CSR comes in, to be able to de-risk these financial structures by blending pools of capital. When CSR or grant funding takes the, uh, the junior note or takes uh, the bigger risk and allows uh, mainstream capital to taste the risk, to learn the risk, to appreciate the risk and then price the risk. And I think that's what struck me uh, at the UN when I then committed uh, to look at what, what was then being touted as impact bonds. And impact bonds are sustainable, social impact bonds, the development impact bonds uh, that were there two years ago. But one of the things was not sounding right. It was not philosophically sort of resonating with me because it was taking two to three years to get a single bond done. And everyone wanted to do $100 million bonds or $500 million bonds. And yet from our learning at the bottom of the pyramid, you need to be small, you need to be quick because you're dealing with vulnerable populations who don't have the luxury of waiting for two to three years. And so we committed to build micro bonds, SDG impact bonds within three months instead of three years. And as they say, the rest is history. We created a product called the SDG Impact Bond, uh, where we said we will find the outcome funder after the project is put in place, and they will then pay for those outcomes and refinance the debt or the impact investor. And we launched them within three months. Every three months since I spoke at the General Assembly uh, in September 2018, we have launched an impact bond. We did the first one on goal five, focused on women's empowerment, to train 2,000 tribal women to become poultry farmers. We did the second one uh, focused on goal eight, to place 20,000 young people in jobs after skilling and training them. 
And this has been uh, a huge success because this is the first bond done with for-profit enterprises. Till then, most of the impact bonds were done with NGOs. But we felt that if we can build an impact bond for for-profit companies and have outcome funders pay the coupon, then it helps them to get cheaper debt, zero coupon debt, and help them to scale much quicker than an NGO would. And so we were successful again in being able uh, to do the goal eight bond on livelihood. We then launched a combination of five and eight together for women's uh, livelihoods and women entrepreneurship, uh, where we made women's weavers uh, create their own brands of carpets or rugs or dharis. We then did a goal seven bond on clean energy. Uh, we then did a bond on goal two for food security and agriculture. Uh, where we are looking at, you know, creating sustainable agricultural solutions. And finally, uh, a month ago, we did a COVID impact bond focused on women's artisans making products like masks or sanitizers that are needed for COVID. So we want to create really an SDG bond factory that we can bring to market, get investors to come in, get CSR to be the outcome funder, get philanthropists or get uh, foundations to underwrite these bonds to provide the risk guarantees so that capital can come in from mainstream sources. We started with a million dollars uh, in phase one, a million to two million for a micro bond. We want to go to uh, 10X of that to $20 million where we will have co-investors investing with us in the bonds. And hopefully in phase three, $200 million where we will list these on a social stock exchange. So that is really the dream. And so to summarize, I just want to talk about one last uh, way of how we can relook at creating this. Uh, this is some publicity that we got. I was with black hair, COVID clearly has had its impact. Uh, but the fact is, and I want to leave you with this, easy to understand again, uh, using the word Sartu, how do we create and reimagine financing the SDGs? A, using technology, Building technology and uh, Albert Einstein is sort of said to have mentioned that it has become appalling that our technology has exceeded our humanity. And I wanna keep that in mind because if we divorce technology from humanity, then we have only failure staring at us. Second, measurement, absolutely critical in bonds or any financing instrument, the ability to measure. We have seen a lot of greenwashing, and then impact washing, and now SDG washing. Uh, we often wear the pin, and I say, pin there, done that, is not necessarily true. Just because you wear the pin or put the flag uh, is not enough. We need to roll up our sleeves and be there measuring impact at every level. Results-based financing is the new paradigm. How do we move into that paradigm? We don't put money to build a school, but we put money to pay for learning outcomes. We don't put money to build a hospital, but we pay for health outcomes. We don't put money to set up social, uh, solar projects, but we pay for decarbonization. So moving away from paying for input to paying for outcomes or results. And we talked about this earlier, a total ecosystem approach where everyone's connected, everyone's bringing solutions, policymakers, government, private sector, public sector, students, universities, all putting their heads together to make sure no one is left behind. I do want to end uh, with what Mr. Kapuscinski himself was called, the voice of the poor. If we are able to put the voice of the poor at the heart of our work, if we are able to make sure that no one is left behind, then we can build back better, cleaner, greener, and more inclusive. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, I got a lot of food to thought already. Um, before we move to the audience question, I want to I want to pick your brain on on, on some issues as well, which uh, which I started thinking while while listening to you. Do I get it correctly that essentially what you you're saying that uh, the the solution that you have been providing is basically solving an an, uh, an information problem that. Uh, uh, there is actually a business model for doing well and doing good at the same time. Uh, the reason why we haven't really seen that is because uh, the resources haven't really seen where the need is and, and, and haven't really uh, connected there. 
So uh, if that is an informational problem, then uh, the wider question I have is, let's say, this microfinance um, solution, which you have been able to scale. And that is the, that is the sort of the most important takeaway for me here. How to uh, find ways to scale these good models? And this tends to be, let's say, especially in, in policy design, the number one problem. I mean, we know what works, how to scale that. Um, so uh, is the sort of the main lesson learned from this is that uh, you actually show that there's an ecosystem that sort of is self-scaling uh, and uh, brings the result or, um, I mean, the impact usually obviously comes from uh, behavioral change. Uh, so it's not the ecosystem, but actually how to uh, incentivize people to do these crucial changes in behavior that are going to bring us the effect, or is it both? I mean, the ecosystem plus these mechanisms to to um, uh, change behavior. So I have a, a naughty answer for you, and then I'll give you the right answer. I think the naughty answer is to get a Nobel Peace Prize. Once you get it, then everyone gets aware of it, uh, and it becomes uh, well known. But it's interesting, and, I, and I'm saying it now even seriously. If you see the trajectory, 2006, Professor Yunus won the Nobel Peace Prize, Grameen Bank shared it with him. 2007, the United Nations declared it the year of microcredit, and then it just took off. So I think it's important for us to be able to give recognition, to be able to come onto a common platform and talk about it. And I see uh, the SDGs having a similar momentum. I remember it was launched at the, at the UN, uh, and Pope Francis was there and they talked about this is a moment of hope for the world. Uh, and we see we need to be constantly talking about the SDGs. We need to be recalibrating our work. Even our COVID response should be measured on the SDGs. We seem to have forgotten it. COVID has distracted everyone. And in fact, it's actually an important moment where we can look at the SDGs and build block by block, brick by brick, uh, by putting the momentum together. So uh, the short answer, Mikhail, uh, it needs recognition. It needs a global platform. We have world leaders today that are supportive, but again, our world leaders are in a dichotomy. I think it's up to the civil citizens now, civil society to stand up uh, and, and create our own networks. It's up to the universities, for example, Tartu, uh, to create your own networks. It's important that people stand up uh, and take the world and its future in their own hands. Yeah, sorry, you were breaking up. That's uh, that's probably on my side. Um, but when I was sort of um, thinking in, in uh, about the answer. Um, Will you say that, let's say, the, the, the model which you have uh, designed, it, which clearly seems to work in terms of, let's say, addressing one particular SDG, uh, mainly, let's say, uh, no poverty, uh, that we can uh, uh, take this model and um, change the, uh, the main, not, not change for this particular solution, but use it to address one another very pressing SDG, climate action, climate change. Is that model somehow uh, in an abstract level also applicable there? Because when I think about uh, uh, the, the nature of the problem, it's, it's, it's very similar. I mean, I, the, the change comes from the individual behavior, but at the same time, how do how do do well, do good for the climate? I mean, keep your, let's say, standard of living or improve that, but not at the expense of, of, uh, of the climate. So how to solve that puzzle, uh, puzzle there as well? Could you think, or I mean, let me pick your brain here a bit. Do you see that this could be applicable? Um, uh, for this Absolutely. Other? Absolutely. In fact, I was just picking up my phone because I got a message from the first minister in Latin America, which is the Ministry for Climate Change. There is a new ministry got created in Argentina. Uh, Patricio Lombardi is that minister. Uh, and, and we are trying to create an SDG 7 impact bond that cuts across uh, communities working or, or living in forests. How do we create uh, an ecosystem for those communities? How can we make them support the forest and yet get their livelihood? And if we can create a bond, which is looking at green cover, for example, and I know Je uh, Jeffrey Sachs talks about using drones and satellites uh, to map and to measure green cover. And if that can be the outcome 
uh, for their outcome bond, then we should be able to go to large corporations like Shell or go to uh, you know, climate funds and say, you be the outcome funder. If we can provide funding to women in communities working in the forest, who live in the forest, so that they can take care of the forest and the forest take care of them. And that livelihood product, whether it's in the jungles uh, in Brazil or Argentina, whether it's in Papua New Guinea, whether it's in uh, you know, Jharkhand in India or uh, somewhere in, in, in Africa, uh, we create a global South bond. And the ability then to be able to catalyze this is far more compelling. Thank you. And actually, uh, you by looking at the questions from the audience, which, which have been uh, submitted at the moment, I see that we basically answered already one of them as well, this, this uh, clean energy bond, essentially. Clean. How do how, how, how you uh, package that problem into this particular solution to it? Uh, and uh, there seems to be, at least, I mean, we should try it. Uh, it seems to be something that, um, that might be working. But the, the question from the audience related to this is actually how to then do measure this, uh, uh, this outcome. When you say that you, you should pay for outcomes, not inputs, uh, and then when we're talking about clean energy bonds, then um, how, would you, how would you measure that? Would it, would it be possible to some do it? Yeah, so uh, I'll spend a minute first on, on the earlier question, again, for a little more detail. Uh, one of the things that we are looking at is making micro bonds. And I think it's different from an approach of the one that probably Erica talked about earlier in the green bonds. Most of the green bonds seem to be $500 million, uh, $5 billion, $50 billion, uh, and, and large projects. Uh, and, and, we are try and there's nothing wrong with that. So it should continue. But we're saying, can we create a groundswell of movement? Can we create many such small projects uh, for a wind farm, for a, a, a solar project, uh, or, a, or a, a reforestation project, and allow many of those to come together uh, rather than have just one large ticket size. Because the moment you build a large 100 million or uh, 100 billion dollar bond, uh, it's very difficult to reach the real lives of the real people at the bottom. Uh, and therefore, we come to measurement. For example, in the Goal 5 bond, which we did, which was to train uh, 2,000 tribal women to become poultry farmers. Uh, we actually put the number of chickens, the number of coops built, the training hours given to the women, uh, the market linkages, and the household income of the woman after starting that activity. All of those were outcomes that we defined before the project started. So we put the outcomes up front. And then at every stage, we measure against those outcomes. And we find outcome funders who are committed to those outcomes. So who are the natural allies is very important. For example, in a women's bond, the natural ally could be a Unilever or a Johnson & Johnson or a Procter & Gamble. For a clean energy bond, it may be a Shell or, or, or uh, you know, one of the large corporations. Uh, for a food security bond, it could be a Nestle or it could be, again, a food company or craft. Uh, for a bond on, uh, on health, it could be Novartis or, or a healthcare company. So we need to create very specific products and smaller ecosystems for each bond. And therefore, I'm, I'm keeping on stressing everything we do, we need to come back. And there are not only 17 goals. There are 169 indicators behind that. And people you know, like to talk about the 17 and know them by heart. But below those are those indicators. And if we can map outcomes to those indicators and then measure those indicators. Uh, and, and, and the one who taught me all of this was actually Akim Steiner uh, you know, in, uh, in the UNDP when we met uh, speaking at the, at the General Assembly in 2018. So the, the need for us to be able to articulate, to be able to define, and then to be able to measure is absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. Okay, then following up on that um, uh, question uh, seems to be related uh, to, to what you just said uh, in the questions that the audience is putting to us um, is that um, if, I, if I look at the, the solutions you, you are advocating, they seem to be bringing, let's say, outsized effects in, 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 the, in the poorer countries or, or uh, the very poorest, let's say, segment of the population. Could these have, uh, solutions uh, potentially be used also, let's say, in mid-income countries um, uh, or mid-income population segments? Because 
depending obviously on the circumstances, but these tend to be actually relatively nominally very large um, um, either populations or, or, or segments. So actually when we really truly want to make a, uh, an aggregated large impact, not only outside the impacts at the, at the lower level of the bottom of the pyramid, as you were saying, would this work in mid-income countries as well, or is it, is it sort of um, applicable there as well? So I think uh, I'm reminded of my time in Estonia last year, where we met uh, some very young, bright startups. Uh, and there's a huge technology uh, boom in Estonia, uh, both in Tallinn and in Tartu. And we met young entrepreneurs who were creating health apps, uh, fintech apps, and, and a whole new product range uh, coming out of technology. And so again, uh, the challenge there is how do you mix them or mesh them with the SDGs? If at all, that's your intent. And if you don't, that's also fine. I mean, business is needed across the spectrum. Uh, but if you want to build a sustainable business, if you want to build a meaningful business, uh, you know, then it's good to build it uh, with the SDGs in mind because uh, that's where we see the world changing towards. Uh, and, and therefore, it's not necessarily where there are large you know, pockets of poverty or large populations that this works alone. You can still build a social enterprise. You can still build a social business. Uh, we have examples of Grameen Denon, Grameen Adidas, Grameen Veolia, Grameen BASF. So many, many companies, each one focused on one need. Grameen Denon on malnourishment. Grameen Adidas uh, to be able to create footwear for those who go without footwear and therefore you know, their feet crack and the, the worms enter through the body, uh, into the body from the cracks in the feet or Grameen BSF for malaria and mosquito nets that are chemically treated. So the ability for us to create a business solution for a social problem is universal. Mid-income countries, rich countries, uh, or poor countries. It doesn't matter. The mindset matters, and the passion matters, and the heart to be able to do this matters. Thank you. Uh, now, again, following up, let's say uh, uh, this, this model seems to be sort of scalable and usable with slight adjustments in, in very different settings to address quite uh, different problems or obviously under this SDG uh, umbrella. There's a question uh, from the audience that sort of um, moves towards more maybe um, getting advice from a banker, <laughs> from a very special banker that uh, Let's say when you are a philo uh, philanthropist, uh, you, you um, put your money where you believe it, it makes a difference and you don't really sort of, uh, uh, I mean, you're only accountable to yourself. But when, when there's a uh, international development organization or partner that usually uses some sort of taxpayer money coming from somewhere, there is a need to be accountable down to the very last cent. How is that, let's say, um, reconcilable with that? Uh, a, a model that um, at, uh, would like to achieve its results with having millions of small uh, projects um, uh, it becomes a bit sort of more problematic and how, how what would you sort of recommend uh, how would that work when you have a lot of these potential losses obviously as well uh, but at the same time uh, uh, ensuring accountability that's an excellent question uh, so congratulations to whoever answered that and i think the best way uh, the best thing you can do as a banker is to be a good banker. So you should not compromise on risk. You should not compromise on the quality of the portfolio. However, can you also be a creative banker and see is there a way to de-risk your portfolio by finding a natural ally? And I'm keeping on repeating this many times because that's what blended finance is. How do you blend different motivations of capital into a single instrument. And I'll give you an example. Rockefeller Foundation, uh, he was working with Grameen Foundation uh, to try and help to scale up microfinance. And there was a big push. Uh, and I remember someone came to us and said, there's a foundation who wants to give $5 million uh, for microfinance in India. Please give it to a microfinance company. And we said, uh, no, first they said, please take this money. And we said, no. Uh, they said, please take this money. We don't take... Uh, anyone's money. Uh, we have we create structures and we allow the capital to flow. And we said no. Uh, and then they were insisting that we give it to a microfinance company who could give it as a grant. And we said, if you are insisting, we would suggest a structure. 
you keep the money with you in New York. Let Citibank New York give a bank guarantee to a local bank in India. That local bank in India will lend money to a microfinance company because they are fully guaranteed. So they are not taking any risk. Mm -hmm. They have a line on Citibank. They have Citibank credit lines. There's no problem there. They will lend to a microfinance company. The microfinance company will break it up into a small $20, $50 and give it out to thousands of women. We know the model works. So the model will work. They will repay the microfinance company. The microfinance company will repay the bank and the guarantee in Citibank doesn't get used. So we then give it to another bank in India and they give it to another microfinance company and that cycle happens again. And then we give it to a third bank. So from the same 5 million, we were able to catalyze $150 million to different banks and different microfinance companies because we were able to de-risk. Now, look at what happened to the first bank. The first bank got a whole credit cycle, got the whole track record, got the whole experience, and the next time they didn't need the guarantee. So slowly, every bank began to lend without the guarantee because they understood the risk. So all we are saying is, initially, let philanthropic capital, let foundation money, let government development aid de-risk. Allow and catalyze fresh capital, allow and catalyze and leverage commercial capital, mainstream capital, and let capital then flow. Thank you. Um, questions keep uh, coming in. There is a very interesting question. Um, I want to hear your opinion on this. Uh, um, one particular SDG behind exactly behind your head uh, on the on the flag there is actually peace. Uh, 16, exactly. Could you think of ways or ideas how to create a bond for that? Because it seems to be, it seems to be some sort of model that truly uh, can be used to scale uh, in, in addressing different SDGs. As I said earlier, there are three crises. There was a healthcare crisis, which went into becoming an economic crisis, and that went into becoming uh, a humanitarian crisis. Hopefully soon, or sooner rather than later, we will have a vaccine for the healthcare crisis. Uh, the economic crisis, there is no vaccine. For the humanitarian crisis, there is a vaccine. It's called compassion. It's called peace. We need to start finding ways to incentivize that. We need to find finding ways to build a just society. Uh, and, and, and whether you look at any religious tradition, uh, you see the focus on peace. Uh, and, and therefore for us, I think it's important to say how do we build that uh, into, a, in, into an instrument where you can measure outcomes? Mm -hmm. I know for a fact that there is one bond that was created for recidivism, which is to track the number of people who fall back into crime once they have been released from jail. And earlier, uh, they found many cases of repeat offenders. And so they had to be put in higher security prisons, higher costs to the government, higher costs to the exchequer. An NGO went to them and said, whoever gets released from jail, we will work with them. We will train them. We will skill them. We will place them in jobs. We will mentor them. We will counsel their families. We will work with their colleagues. And we will give them a sense of worth, a sense of purpose. And if they fall, so earlier, say, for example, 60% would go back to jail as repeat offenders. And the government would pay another 15,000 pounds to keep them in jail. They said, if we can save uh, and bring that number down from 60% for every single person below 60%, then you share with us seven and a half thousand pounds. Because Mr. Government, you are now saving 15,000 pounds. So you pay Miss NGO seven and a half of that gain. Mm -hmm. And so slowly, if we are able to create those models, we are already seeing COVID has the highest impact on the poor and on people uh, who are of different color. And that is being established across the world. Can we create a model or a structure? Uh, and and that's, uh, there is no one solution that fits all. And therefore the challenge is all to the bright young people, uh, 204 who have registered and many more who will watch it on Facebook. Identify what is the model for peace that you can create something that can be measured. We have many people under trials in jails who have no money to afford a lawyer and are struggling there. 
is there a model whereby we can say we will reduce the number of people who are under trial uh, by X if we do a certain set of activities? And so building peace, building communities of justice is absolutely critical. We need to be able to think differently. We need to broaden our perspective and not think that peace means only for those uh, you know, who are of a certain bent of mind. It is for everyone to be able to create a new solution. Okay, I think this, this answer actually also answered the question which I hadn't put to you yet, but was one of the first questions is that um, uh, the financial markets themselves through these models which are, are, are advertising, we not always they achieve these SDGs alone. Uh, you need to convince the decision makers, uh, the politicians, different countries to, uh, to come along with that. It seems that, I mean, uh, for me at least, uh, how to achieve that, the question was how to achieve that. Um, basically, is what you just said, that uh, you can actually show this decision maker of the world that, uh, well, wait a minute, um, this will actually bring societal benefits, uh, even though when you're simply looking at, uh, let's say, in an Excel table, your, your costs and your resources might not seem like that, but you actually show that, uh, Wait a minute, and this is this is the way how to convince to come on board as well, uh, and then use these mechanisms. Absolutely, and we are seeing governments being changed by people voting uh, if they feel excluded, and that's a common thread across the world. So policymakers have no choice but to sit up and notice, because more and more uh, people are going to move towards civil unrest if they are unable to get their basic needs met. COVID is going to make things only worse. The next six to 12 months are going to get probably tougher before they get easier. And so it is up to the policymakers to be able to be proactive in the ways they are empowering people, in the ways they are supporting initiatives around the SDGs, in the ways they are unlocking capital. $18 trillion has been put out as stimulus. Uh, I would don't even want to hazard a guess how much of that was used towards development aid stimulus at the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, and, and so it's important for us to be that voice to say, uh, let's create new solutions as we build back better rather than pumping in money on the top. And we have ghost companies surviving only because of free liquidity and free injection of funding who will then collapse if that lifeline is taken away. How do we create a new pool of entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs focused on creating good and doing well at the same time? Thank you very much. Um, I would say that the, the, the bulk of questions revolved around uh, this, this one solution to this, uh, this type of problems, how to create these incentive structures for, for common um, um, behavior to do, do well and do good at the same time. And, and uh, through that, let's say, then, then solve this, this information asymmetry to a degree as well, which has been uh, at the root of many of our problems. And obviously we didn't talk too much about digitalization, but it seems to be also one sort of particular tool set that helps us to, to be more efficient in, uh, in that. Well, unfortunately, uh, our time is coming to an end. I would like to keep the discussion going, but uh, I, I unfortunately will have to also stick to the uh, to the timeline um, provided uh, to us by the organizers. Uh, there is a question uh, from the, or a question uh, by an audience member that actually formed as a big thank you. And I would actually um, uh, actually uh, agree with that very much that um, I got a lot of interesting ideas because I'm uh, in, in my own work in terms of research and teaching, always looking for sort of solutions that seem to be somehow transferable. Uh, that can be from one from particular uh, domain or area to be transferred somewhere else to to to, um, uh, to take care of or, or solve a problem there, and I think your uh, your talk uh, definitely actually opened uh, many eyes there. That uh, wait a minute, uh, let's try that. This seems to be one workable model uh, because in one particular solution or domain it has really really scaled. So um, let me echo that. Thank you as well. Um, and uh, and I uh, thank the organizers, UNDP and the European Commission, University of Tartu as well, but mainly obviously you. Uh, and I hope to uh, to see you maybe again physically in presence in Tartu as well in the in the not too distant future. 
and uh, and I think I we all uh, can agree that um, yes, we're facing a green crisis at the moment. Probably going to get worse, but there's nothing better than a crisis to uh, to manage uh, or spur change, change these processes. Uh, this is a window of opportunity, so uh, we have to survive through this, but actually use this really to to try these new models as well. Thank you very much. Aita, God bless you. Aita, um, this uh, ends this uh, cap talk. Uh, mm, I hope uh, that uh, that you got a lot of interesting uh, new ideas. Uh, I do encourage you to go and then and, and take a look at um, um, at what uh, Grameen Capital is doing, uh, uh, the models they have uh, have uh, worked out, and and, uh, and what Royston um, has been implementing in India and uh, in other places as well. Uh, word back to the organizers: the, Does UNTP or the European Commission representative still want to say something? Uh, that would be for my thank you yeah thank you very much uh, thank you very much uh, royston and uh, and michael and uh, all the participants as well uh, and i hope you enjoyed the the, um, the lecture i also uh, uh, encourage you to uh, follow us on facebook and twitter we just shared it on on the chats uh, we also have uh, next month in november another lecture on the 20th uh, of november with Toy Nadaremi on inclusive education on the exactly on the international uh, children's uh, day the video from this lecture will be available as well on uh, our website thank you very much and thank you. Thank you very much also from uh, from my side, extremely inspiring uh, presentation and, and discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you, Royston. Thank you.